Okay, so uh, Wednesday afternoon, let's do this. Today we're going to talk about biotechnology and forensics and a few other really cool things. So I hope you enjoy this lecture. I think everyone is at the point now where maybe we can understand uh, some of the concepts we're going to present here. So a um, whole bunch of things here I'll just say about this before we get into the, uh, into the lecture. Um, First is that uh, if you go to this chapter in the textbook, chapter 20, uh, you're going to see it's talking about all sorts of things. And I just can't cover the whole chapter. So what I've done is I've sort of uh, picked and chosen things that I think are important. And uh, I've also chosen a lot of interesting examples that you're not going to find in the textbook. Um, so, you know, just things that interest me. And uh, so this lecture is usually a little bit different every semester because there's always uh, interesting new things that pop up. So let's take a look at this. First, I want to talk about uh, the DNA toolbox. So what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, I want to talk about some of the uh, techniques that are really handy and that are being used all over the place in molecular biology labs. And uh, these include, you can see uh, these things that we've talked about already. So PCR, uh, enzymes, gel electrophoresis, which we did in the lab. Uh, plasmids and something called CRISPR-Cas9, which is getting a lot of press over the last few years. So first, let's talk about PCR. So I mentioned this, uh, you may remember, we were talking about it uh, kind of just briefly in the unit where we talked about DNA replication. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And so this is the whole idea where we can uh, copy DNA in a tube. And so, uh, what do we need for this? First of all, we need a DNA sample. So uh, this is a kind of technique, by the way, that you might see in a crime show. So the DNA sample could be a single hair from a crime scene or some blood or semen or something like that. Uh, what else do we need? We need, of course, um, pieces to make DNA. So we need the nucleotides. And uh, we also need um, some primers. So and we need to decide uh, what, uh, what fragment of DNA are we looking for. You're not going to copy the entire genome, uh, but we might just copy a little part of it. And then lastly, in the name is polymerase. And we need, of course, a, uh, um, a, a DNA polymerase. Uh, so that's right in the name of the whole thing. So chain reaction is where you do something which leads to something else, which leads to something else, and, uh, and so on, right? And so you may have noticed that this is a heat stable uh, polymerase. So heat stable right there. And this is because we're going to use a lot of heat. So remember with DNA um, replication, we uh, had all sorts of other accessory enzymes. We have the helicase, we have the top isomerase, the single stranded binding protein. Uh, we're kind of skipping all those steps and we're going to do the DNA uh, replication in a tube. So I'll talk about that in a moment. But before I talk about that, I just have a quick Test yourself question. So it says here, what does DNA polymerase do? So we have to think back. So that's well, uh, maybe topic 15 or 16, uh, way, way back. Maybe it's 14, I can't remember now. Um, so what does DNA polymerase do? Let's take a look at this. It says copies a scent strand, copies a template strand, adds nucleotides complementary to the scent strand, add nucleotides complementary to the template strand, makes primers. Okay, so. Let's start uh, way at the bottom here. Next primers, uh, no. Okay, that should be an easy one. There's an enzyme for that and it is called primase. So I'm just gonna write that there. A little bit slower today because I don't have my, uh, my laptop pin. So I gotta do this using a mouse. So hopefully that's neat enough that you can read. Uh, adds nucleotides complementary to the template strand. Uh, actually, that is the right answer. But maybe I'll just come back to that in a moment as to why that's the right answer. Let's take a look at this. Copies the scent strand. Um, uh, no, not quite. Um, DNA polymerase does not necessarily copy the scent strand. Uh, what the enzyme does is it looks at the template strand and puts complementary nucleotides. Uh, this is kind of a sort of right? This is one of those answers that's sort of half right and uh, would probably not be fair to have on a test because it's, it's almost true because the, uh, 
uh, DNA polymerase, the new strand is going to look like the sent strand. Uh, copies the template strand, no, it's complementary to the template strand. And then it says adds nucleotides complementary to the sent strand. Uh, also, that's not true. So hopefully all that made sense. If it doesn't, uh, you're going to have to go back and, and review your notes and figure out what all these things mean. What's a primer? Uh, which one is the sense strand? Which one is the template strand? All that is important information. So let's look at PCR and see how it works. There is the correct answer. A little star. Okay, so first thing for PCR is you need uh, some sort of DNA sample. So like I said, if this was a crime scene, it could be a hair. If I was doing research, maybe this is my subject, right? So uh, I did research on a, a microorganism called Pseudomonas. So this would be some genomic DNA from Pseudomonas. Uh, so there's the DNA, and uh, we're gonna separate the DNA by using heat. We're not using a, a, a helicase or any of the enzymes, we're just using heat. Usually this is about 96 degrees Celsius. And then these primers here, uh, these primers are these little things that you can buy. Uh, they're synthetic, so they're made by a chemist. Actually, they're made by machines nowadays. And uh, they're little fragments that are complementary to the gene of interest that you're looking for, right? So what they're doing is they're providing right here, I know it's not labeled, but they're providing right here, basically a three prime OH, uh, which is the substrate for our DNA polymerase. So next, the uh, DNA polymerase is thrown in there and also the nucleotides, and it's going to uh, make a complementary strand. So if you take a look, we have now two strands. We started off with one, we start off with two, and now we're just gonna do, do this again and again and again. So one cycle gives you two strands, two cycles now gives you four, uh, three cycles gives you eight, uh, Four cycles is going to give you 16, and 20 cycles is going to give you about a million copies of DNA. But try it on your calculator. Go two times two times two times two and do that 20 times. You get about a million. Uh, so suddenly we go from one copy of DNA to many copies of DNA. This is a huge, huge, very, very useful technique in the lab. Before PCR, um, how did we copy DNA? It was, it was a lot of hard work. So what are we doing with PCR? Okay. So uh, maybe the obvious one is genetics research. Uh, I could be studying the gene for hemoglobin. If I'm interested in sickle cell anemia, uh, I could be studying a gene in a, in a moth or a fungus or, or a, a woolly mammoth. Uh, forensics and paternity testing. Uh, I'll show you how that works in a few minutes. Uh, there is a whole new branch of, uh, of uh, it has its own name. I was gonna call it archeology, span but it's not anymore. Uh, looking at DNA of ancient specimens. So we're talking about woolly mammoths, uh, Egyptian mummies, and all sorts of interesting things. And then there's a lot of diagnostic reasons for this. So if you uh, got tested for COVID-19, uh, that's a PCR test. They're actually looking for viral RNA. And there's a number of other uh, organisms that we may use kind of similar tests. So tuberculosis, chlamydia, and uh, certain other viruses. Not all uh, diagnostic tests are uh, using PCR. Uh, the uh, test for COVID-19 is. So uh, I think I mentioned last day, there's another technique uh, that is kind of based off of PCR where we're using uh, fluorescently labeled nucleotides. And then this uh, very expensive machine that can kind of look at the nucleotides and, and read all the colors. And you can see that it makes a little uh, graph of that and that you know, gets converted to a sequence. So this is DNA sequencing. That is a very, very basic <laughs> description of it, but it's hugely useful because it tells us, uh, for example, in January, we had a brand new virus. Uh, we started getting samples of these viruses and we were able to uh, uh, sequence it and, and, and learn that it was a coronavirus and something new that had never been seen before. And uh, so this is very, very important for proofreading, identifying things and so on. There's a lab, this is from the textbook. Um, I like this picture because it's funny because we have Canada's Michael Smith Genomic Lab. So if you're in psychology, that's a different Michael Smith. Probably no surprise there that there are a few Michael Smiths out there in the world. There's another one that was actually a Canadian uh, Olympic athlete. You can look that one up. He, uh, he got gold in decathlon a number of years ago. So what else can we do with DNA in terms of the toolbox? We can cut and paste things. So there's a bunch of enzymes called uh, endonucleases. 
and uh, specifically some of them are called restriction endonucleases because they recognize very specific sequences. So here's a sequence here. You can see AGCT. If I read this backwards on the other strand, it's AGCT. And the enzyme's name is ALU1. It's usually an abbreviation for something. And it will cut the uh, DNA. It's all sorts of sequences. Here's ECOR1. ECOR1 is actually from E. coli. It kind of does a funny cut. It sort of cuts here. It's going to cut like that and uh, separate this thing and kind of make something that we call a sticky end. But uh, basically, we have precision scissors, which are these uh, special uh, enzymes, these endonucleases. So how might this work? Uh, you can see there's a bacteroplasmid. I'm going to cut that DNA with E. coli 1. There we go. We're going to come along. We're going to cut another gene. So maybe I want to study the gene for human insulin, and I want to put it in E. coli to study. I'm going to cut it with the same restriction endonucleases. Uh, you put those in a test tube. Uh, of course, they're not quite joined yet. They're going to, the hydrogen bonds are going to join. And the last thing we need to do is throw in some ligase. So that's the same DNA ligase that we would use in uh, DNA replication. So now we're making something called recombinant DNA. So we're kind of mixing two DNA samples together. And I'll show you some reasons why we want to do that in a minute. I just want to talk about the tools first. So two more tools to talk about. One is uh, agarose uh, gel electrophoresis. So we talked about this in the lab as uh, a mechanism for separating uh, samples out based on size. So we can do DNA and RNA. We can actually do protein gel electrophoresis as well. Uh, there's the gel, this, uh, this green thing here. And of course, uh, you know, we stick the DNA in the gel. You can see this well here. Uh, the DNA is negatively charged due to the phosphates. We apply an electrical field and the, uh, the DNA will migrate through the gel Larger pieces are, are impeded by the agarose matrix and go a little bit slower, so the, the shorter pieces are, are a little bit uh, faster, and so you can separate things very predictably based on size. So here's an image of, the, of a gel from the textbook, and uh, here's another image I found on the internet, and you can see uh, this has a nice ladder here on the, uh, on the left. So the large pieces are up here, and so this band here, for example, is 6 kb, which is 6,000 uh, base pairs, and so that would be this band here. Uh, the shorter band, so this one here is about maybe 750 base pairs, and uh, it ran a little bit faster. So this can tell us, is our sample there? How big is our sample? And those kind of things. I'll show you an example of a technique that can be used to diagnose someone with uh, sickle cell anemia. I don't think this particular technique is used anymore, but it is one way to do it. Um, so if you take a look, there is the gene for beta glob globulin or globin. That is part of hemoglobin. And if you take a look at this, uh, it has these restriction sites. So D, D, E, 1, and it cuts it four times. So if you think about this, you're going to get three fragments. One, two, and three. And we can run that on a gel. Now, if someone has sickle cell anemia, uh, one of those restriction sites is missing. And so we're actually only getting two fragments. So it's pretty easy to PCR out that piece of DNA and, uh, and throw in some restriction enzymes and uh, then throw it on a, on a gel. So you can see someone who uh, has the normal allele has three bands and someone who has sickle cell anemia is going to have two bands. And so a pretty uh, simple, straightforward di diagnostic technique. So as I mentioned, we can have RNA gels. So there's some RNA gel here. We can have a protein gel. This is actually a protein that uh, I studied. I uh, purified this protein. You can see uh, uh, the various steps of my procedure. And it's, it's not perfectly pure, but it's a pretty decent uh, clean sample uh, for this particular protein anyway. So uh, how does a typical uh, project work? Um, all these techniques are put into play. And I'll show you some examples. These are from the textbook, and then I'll talk about some, uh, some other uh, real-world examples. Um, so generally, the first thing that happens is there's a gene of interest. So PCR is used to copy that gene of interest, right? And uh, you're going to get a bunch of copies of that gene. Next thing is going to happen is restriction enzymes are going to, uh, are going to cut uh, often a plasmid or some, some sort of other vector. By a vector, I mean something to carry that DNA around and maybe put it into a bacteria with it, something that would have maybe an origin of replication. 
and uh, the gene of interest is going to be cut and pasted into that plasmid, and uh, the pasting is going to use the enzyme ligase. Usually somewhere in there, uh, the work is going to be verified by gel electrophoresis and sequencing. And then, uh, you know, then that plasmid might be put back into E. coli or, you know, if you're trying to grow something else, maybe it's put into yeast or a plant or something like that, depending on, on what's going on, right? So then now you have a bacteria with a gene of interest and uh, the bacteria can be cultured. And depending on, uh, you know, what's going on, um, the protein can be harvested and used, you know, maybe it's insulin uh, or the, or the uh, DNA can be used itself. And here's some examples from the textbook, right? So we have a bacterium that's been altered to clean up oil spills. Um, that was not a very successful project, by the way. Uh, pest resistance inserted into plants. So this actually uh, technique has been used quite a number of times in corn and soybean. Um, we can have drugs. So sometimes people need human growth hormone. These are just proteins, um, drugs for dissolving uh, blood clots, uh, many, 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 many applications. So I mentioned there was one other technique that I wanted to talk about. This technique is called uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, I, uh, I found this video here actually that just explains it really, really well. Uh, so I thought I'd play that for you. I think uh, what I have to do is just make sure that I am actually sharing my computer sound. And I'll play this for you. It's a relatively short video. And, uh, um, and then at the end of this, we'll talk about uh, We'll talk about uh, um, some of the uh, um, actual applications. We'll play this video for you right now. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. That's why it's just called CRISPR. First discovered in bacteria, CRISPRs are like bacterial immune systems. They have two key parts, a destroyer protein, like one called Cas9, and a piece of RNA that matches viruses that previously infected the bacteria. If the same virus were to invade again, the RNA would recognize the invader's DNA, attach itself to its old enemy, and its Cas partner would slice the virus's DNA destroying it. A few years ago, some researchers realized they could use CRISPR to edit the genome of any living organism. Here's the idea. Say I have a stretch of DNA, maybe a part of a gene I'd like to change. If I know the sequence of letters there, I can build a CRISPR that carries a matching code. Once inside the cell, CRISPR will scan the DNA until it finds that exact spot. And when it does, it slices the DNA right there. Now I have a broken gene, but it turns out I can insert a new sequence into the gap. And that makes CRISPR potentially an extremely powerful tool. Okay, so uh, like I said, CRISPR is getting so much press because it's amazing how powerful it is. Um, this is from the textbook showing what's going on. Uh, like you said, uh, like he said, uh, the whole idea is we can we can select a particular gene, and uh, and like any sequence. And uh, the huge advantage over CRISPR is really three things, right? One, it can be done in a living cell. So a lot of DNA manipulation before you had to do it in a test tube first, and and then you had to eventually get it into a cell. And all that takes time, a lot of trial and error. This is very precise, can be done actually in an actual living cell. Uh, it's very highly precise, and many genes can be done simultaneously. So like I said, tons and tons of people are super excited over this. And at the end of this lecture today, I'll share uh, three exciting CRISPR projects. Um, so right now, what I want to do is just share with you some, um, some uh, applications of biotechnology, so things that have been done and are being done and maybe will be done soon. And uh, some of these are some really uh, exciting and very, very cool projects. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first, I wanna talk about forensics and uh, paternity testing, which is kind of the same technology, just looking for different things. So there's, uh, there's a few older techniques, but the, the technique that's used now is called uh, 
uh, varium, variable number tandem repeat method. And uh, basically it's using PCR. And so, okay, we're looking for differences in individuals. So what exactly uh, are the differences? You know, apparently our DNA, we're all 99% identical. So it turns out that uh, in the human genome, um, there are places in our genome that have these repeats. And these repeats are called VNTRs. So variable number tandem repeats. Uh, some people have more, some people have less, and it turns out there's actually one area in our genome that there's a, a reasonable amount of uh, variability. And so you can see, uh, you know, if I take a look, here's, here's um, an allele we're looking at, right? So this allele here is this uh, uh, VNTRA, right? And uh, one individual has a five and a two. Remember, we all have uh, two copies of every chromosome, right? One from mom and one from dad. Individual two has uh, two different alleles, right? So what we can do is we can PCR out that part and run it on a gel. I'll show you another illustration how that might work. Uh, here's a gel actually of, um, I think I found this one on Wikipedia, uh, looking at one allele and you can see that uh, uh, six individuals, uh, um, even looking at just one allele, we actually have a decent amount of, um, of uh, differences here. So often we call this a uh, technique uh, DNA fingerprinting. Not sure what happened there. DNA FI in fingerprinting, meaning that everybody is uh, has a unique pattern. Now, part of the problem is if we just look at one allele, there is by chance that if I tested all of uh, you in this class, uh, we might have a couple people with something similar. Um, so often we'll look at several alleles. So if you take a look at this, here's uh, back to that original example. We've got individual one, individual two. Um, they have two different sets of alleles. And uh, so we can look at another region, another VNTR uh, part of, of uh, one of your chromosomes. And so now when you run it on a gel, you have four bands. And uh, we're looking at less and less likely people are gonna have identical bands. Because like I said, it happens once in a while. Uh, people will share a, a band that's similar or the same as someone uh, just by chance. Uh, the more bands you have, the less likely by chance that you will have uh, an exact match with someone, unless that someone is your identical twin, of course. Um, of course, with uh, siblings, you should have about 50% of a match. So let's uh, talk about how this works. Um, you know, a classical example of this is paternity testing. So that means testing to see that, uh, you know, the child and the father are biologically related. And... Um, I googled paternity testing and a few ads actually popped up. So there's clearly people in Fort McMurray that are doing this. Uh, this here also came up. I don't think you can buy this kind of thing in the pharmacy in, in, uh, in Canada, but somewhere out there uh, it was found in the, um, in the family planning uh, birth control pregnancy test section apparently. Um, you can even see the price on there, right? A hundred and uh, uh, so whatever the cost of the, the kit is, plus $119, and um, relatively straightforward. Usually it's just a saliva sample or it's a scrape from the inside of the cheeks. It gets sent away to a company and they do the PCR. So the company would do the PCR. And uh, so if you take a look at this, usually you're also testing the mother as a, as a positive control. So here's the child here in the middle, and the child is going to have 50% um, of his or her DNA should match the mother and 50% uh, of his or her DNA uh, should match the father. And so that's kind of what we're looking for. If the uh, father is not the father, biological father, then uh, you have this positive control where half the DNA matches the mom, and then none of these bands here uh, match the dad. Although there might be one or two by chance, uh, if you, if you, unless you had um, checked several regions, right? So here's a real paternity test. Uh, the names of the uh, individuals uh, are, are not uh, the real individuals, I, I, but uh, you can get the idea, right? We have a whole bunch of bands and we're looking to see that 50% of the bands, right, are gonna match the child. So here's the child right here. Luke Skywalker is the child. And this is the mother here. And then, so which one's the father? So we can check that the mother and the child looks like about half of these bands are matching. And, uh, it's a little bit more crowded down in this zone, and this is not the sharpest picture, it's just the sharpest one I could find, uh, unfortunately. And then we can check the fathers, and if we take a look, it looks like Darth Vader, 
um, indeed has about 50% of the DNA matching. So this is a, you know, a test and whereas OB1 doesn't look like we have uh, too many matching bands, maybe a, few, a couple here or there by chance. So by the way, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you a question on the final exam. Uh, one of these kind of questions, I'll have a gel and I'll ask you some questions about it. So I'll, I'll have a sample one I have at the very end, I think it's the last slide uh, in this particular lecture. So uh, here's an example from the textbook uh, talking about forensic testing. So forensics, of course, is uh, looking at crime scenes and it's featured really heavily in, in movies. Uh, it's not done quite as often in real crime scenes because uh, it's expensive. And usually there's enough other data, eyewitnesses and things like that to convict a person. So they often only use it if they need to. Uh, in this case here, this man, Earl Washington, uh, was in prison for 17 years and he was convicted um, as someone uh, convicted in a, in a rape. And um, you can see uh, that uh, semen was found on the victim and, uh, and uh, he was able to get um, his DNA tested. Uh, you know, he had an appeal. So if you take a look at these markers here, right, uh, that are found on the semen, we've got markers 17 and 19. He doesn't match there. They did three markers. Another one here. Uh, this one also does not match. And then uh, the third one, you can see, you know, this, this one here matched by chance. But basically, the profile doesn't look anything like Earl. There was a second suspect. They were able to, uh, by court order, uh, get his DNA. And it turns out that he was a perfect match for the DNA found on the victim. And so uh, this guy uh, was released from prison and uh, the other guy was put into prison. And uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, uh, kind of uh, um, forensic science nowadays. So um, just to be sure that we're not having any chance, uh, the DNA databases that are used by, uh, the, uh, by Canada and, uh, and, and the Americans, uh, is something called CODIS. This was actually developed in the States by the FBI uh, National Database. And they're using 13 markers. So they're being very, very careful that, uh, you know, there would be no matches by chance. Uh, the Canadian database called the National DNA da uh, Data Bank uh, also uses the CODIS, CODIS system, and so does Interpol in Europe. So if you ever hear the word CODIS on a movie, uh, they're talking about DNA testing. If you're not needing a paternity test or any forensic testing, you just think this is super cool, I found this on the internet. Um, you can get DNA portraits. So you can get a unique profile of your own DNA and you can hang it up as artwork in your home. And, and it's, uh, I thought it was really cool, very beautiful. Maybe someday I'll get one of these for Christmas, who knows. So um, there's lots of medical applications of biotechnology. Uh, I showed you this one before, uh, how we can, uh, um, you know, cut and paste DNA for medical applications. The classic example is human insulin. You can see there's my human cell and my E. coli. So you take the uh, uh, DNA out of the human cell, use restriction enzymes to cut it and ligase to paste it into a plasmid. And there, then you get something called a recombinant DNA. The plasmid is then uh, put back in E. coli by transformation, exactly what we did in lab nine. And then the E. coli is grown in a fermentation tank and, uh, and it's going to uh, you know, produce whatever's on that gene. And in that case, we're looking at human insulin. And so there's a couple of companies that do this nowadays. And uh, so if you're diabetic, you have a, you have a treatment. Uh, before this time, um, how did we get insulin? We had to harvest it from animals and the animals didn't like that. We had to basically harvest their entire pancreas. So it was a death sentence for the animals. Um, there's a bunch of other applications here I'll, I'll mention. Uh, uh, here's a word for you, transgenic, okay? Um, this, by the way, is just a Photoshop thing. This isn't a real uh, frog, but when I was I Googled transgenic, there were lots of interesting little things that came up. I thought this one was pretty clever. Um, but the whole idea of something transgenic, uh, that means you're combining DNA from one organism to another. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much, by the way, about kind of the ethics of this. Um, that's all, that would be almost a full another lecture. I realize that some people think this is pretty cool, and other people are like, okay, wait a second, what's going on here? Um, and uh, it, is, it is a good question to ask uh, whether we should be doing this. 
um, we're kind of beyond that point in many cases where we are doing it. And the question is which applications maybe are, um, are worthy or not. Uh, I'll show you some applications here that are being done. Uh, this one here is an interesting application where uh, what they've done, you can, you can read there, it says they, they've taken the gene for human antithrombin-3. So where is that right here? Human antithrombin-3. So that's, a, that's a, an anti-blood clotting factor. And so if you are uh, getting surgery, uh, this is a very crucial thing to have. We don't want your blood to clot while somebody is doing surgery on you. So they go through gallons and liters and tons of this stuff uh, when doing surgery, and it's very, very expensive. So this company here, uh, what they've done is they've, uh, they've made something and they kind of, they, they have a cute name for it. They call it a farm animal, right? So farm, like pharmacy, <laughs> so very cute. Farm animal, there it goes again. Okay, I'm just trying to finish my word here, farm animal. Uh, and so what they've done is they've engineered it so that they put the human gene inside the goat and they've engineered it in such a way that the human protein is made and produced in the goat milk. And so you don't have to kill the animal. Uh, you can just milk the goat and extract the, uh, extract the protein from the milk. So very, very cool idea. Uh, very useful. This company has made a load of money off of this. Because um, they come up with a, a good idea and a, a, a much cheaper way to do this. Because in order to get any thrombin before, um, we basically had to use liters and liters and liters of blood that were donated to blood banks. And uh, so that was very, very, very expensive. Here's a little cartoon for you. Uh -huh. So, you know, lots of people make fun of genetic engineering. You can see uh, you've got the, the Venus flytrap there uh, on the tail of the donkey. And it's, uh, it's dealing with the, the flies that are coming around, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, it's kind of a lame joke, but I want to show you this is actually not too far from uh, one project that was done. Uh, this was a project here that was done at the University of Guelph. Um, and uh, I know one of the professors involved in this project. And uh, I don't know a ton about farming, but one thing I do know is that animals can make a lot of waste. And it turns out that, um, that pigs uh, have a lot of phosphorus in their feces. And uh, of course that is uh, you know, polluting the environment and it's, it's really bad. And so um, there were a couple of professors at the University of Guelph and uh, both involved in genetics research and they realized that they kind of, you know, they, they could do something here. Uh, there is an enzyme in E. coli called phytase and this enzyme actually breaks down the phosphate. So they engineered these pigs so the phytase would be made in the pig's saliva. And, it, and uh, it turns out these pigs make low phosphate waste. So this is a super cool idea. Uh, they developed these pigs, they called them the Enviro pig. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, this project was a bit of a dud um, because in terms of the timing, uh, when they had this thing, people uh, at the time, this was a number of years ago now, were very skeptical of genetically modified organisms. And uh, so they're never able to actually sell this pig, uh, unfortunately for them. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll talk about some su successful projects uh, in a minute. But like I said, you know, people will have skepticism about new things. And, uh, and this was one project that failed due to that, unfortunately. Um, some projects that are successful uh, are used all over the place. And we're talking about Canada too. Uh, if you look at the canola in Canada, uh, a very high percentage, I think, think something like 85-90% of canola in Canada is genetically modified. And um, there's a number of other corns, you can see these are some main crops here, corn and soybeans, canola, alfalfa, and cotton. Uh, these are all been engineered to be called Roundup Ready. So you're probably thinking, what is Roundup? Roundup is a pesticide, it's a herbicide. Um, you can buy it at Canadian Tire and um, it kills plants really well. Uh, I actually bought some because I have these bricks at home and there's always these little uh, plants growing up between the bricks and I spray the Roundup on there and it does a really good job of, of killing them. And so uh, the whole idea here is that you, um, you make your plants resistant to Roundup and so you can spray the pesticide and it kills all the, all, all the things you don't want to grow and your, your crop will grow, right? So I know this is like crazy because I'm thinking, 
why do we want to use more pesticides? But actually, the, the data actually shows that they use less pesticides. Um, you know, farmers use pesticides. They use a lot of it, and this actually allows them to use a little bit less. I think it's something like 20% less um, because they don't need to use as much, and they're getting guaranteed crops. And if you ever know a farmer, ask them about this because, uh, you know, the, the ability to uh, have a crop that you know is, is going to grow is, is just, it's amazing, right? Um, they, they can have, a, you know, some years are really bad for them. And just giving something a little bit more of a guarantee is always a good thing. Uh, there's lots of uh, transgenic things that are novelties. I uh, mentioned the, uh, the glow fish before. These are fish that have uh, uh, jellyfish fluorescent genes in them. And uh, I just learned that apparently you can now buy them in Canada. They've been around for at least 10 years. And uh, I, I think I learned that they just basically made it to Canada very recently. So I was going to go to an aquarium shop and take a look. because I, um, I was thinking it would be very cool to have one of these at home. Um, other things are, you know, this was an art project done in, I think it was Germany, where people were asking questions about whether we should genetically modify things. So a guy made a fluorescent bunny as well. There's a lot of, uh, lot of reasons why people use fluorescent research. Uh, here's an example of um, these things made at Harvard called the rainbow mice. Try to say that fast. It's kind of a, a funny word to say. Um, and uh, the whole idea here is, uh, they're looking at neurons, so these are cells in the brain, and they light up and they fluoresce, right? And, uh, you know, trying to understand the brain is really, really hard. Um, you know, the alternative to that is basically dissecting animals. And uh, um, neurological scientists uh, who do this kind of research uh, traditionally have gone through, you go through a lot of animals, like a lot. You're basically dissecting them every time you're trying to learn something. The whole uh, traditional way to do it is to inject some dye into the brain, which will kill them, that freezes the brain in, in a certain thought pattern, and then dissect it and try to figure out what's going on. With these rainbow mice, uh, they don't have to euthanize and kill the animals all the time. Um, so it is, it is helping uh, brain research, uh, which, is, which is great. You know, we want to use less animals and not more. Um, Here's another example of something, again, it sounds a little cruel, but doing some cancer research and having a fluorescent tumor. Um, and uh, it's not, uh, you know, the mouse here isn't so happy about it, but, uh, you know, human cancer is an important uh, research area. Here is a statistic that every single one of us has to deal with. You have about a 50% about a, uh, a chance in your lifetime of getting cancer and uh, maybe a 20% chance of dying of cancer. So this is something that all of us have to deal with. We don't get cancer ourselves, we will know some of the cancer. So cancer research is very important. And, um, and having a, a way to observe tumors um, as, they, as they grow uh, was a huge advantage of this particular mouse. So like I said, lots of medical research for uh, this kind of technology. So uh, a few other things here. I know we're, I'm getting down there. I know we've have got about 10 minutes left. I have some other interesting projects to show you. Um, I mentioned before that PCR can be used for looking at uh, uh, historical or archaeological DNA samples. So maybe uh, you saw this little movie or read this book, uh, Jurassic Park. And the whole idea in Jurassic Park was, of course, that they had these insects that were preserved in amber, and uh, in the insect gut was blood from dinosaurs. So people are asking, okay, are we going to get our dinosaurs? Um, the answer is no, probably not. Um, the data seems to show that DNA does break down over time. Um, it probably lasts maybe 50,000 years max kind of thing, maybe 100,000 years. So we're not going to get dinosaurs. We do have a few fragments of dinosaur DNA, but not enough to really say much about it. But that being said, we have much newer samples. And here is a really fascinating uh, story of some newer DNA that has been looked at. Um, you may or may not be aware of this particular uh, human. This guy's name, he's given a name, Otzi the Iceman. So he was found, uh, I think it was about 20, or 20 years ago now uh, in, the, um, in the Alps. So I think it was uh, maybe between Italy and Switzerland, kind of on the border there. And uh, this is the oldest 
best preserved human specimen we have. We do have older Egyptian mummies, but uh, the Egyptians, they used chemicals and they took all the organs out and all that. This guy had everything. He, he had stuff in his stomach. He had clothing. Um, really an amazing, amazing find. Uh, basically a Bronze Age uh, hunter. And uh, many fascinating studies done on him. You know, we, we, you know, we have his clothing, we have his bow and arrows, uh, those kind of things. Um, a, a number of years ago now, they did some DNA studies on this guy, and they were looking at, uh, at blood, because um, he had blood on his gear and blood on his, uh, on his cloak. And uh, they looked and they found um, some interesting samples. Uh, so they were looking at his knife, for example, right? And on his knife, they found somebody's blood that was not his blood. So another human's blood on his knife. Okay, uh, what about his arrows? So on his arrows, they found two other people's blood samples uh, that were not his own. And they found blood on his coat. I'm not sure why it's doing that. But uh, found one other blood sample on his coat. Uh, so this kind of tells a bit of a story that this man had, um, you know, there was a little bit of violence or war or something in his life. Um, so it looks like he uh, possibly killed a, a couple other humans, uh, maybe carried a wounded comrade on his back. Um, we're not really sure of the full story, but uh, the DNA does give us some hints into uh, this man's past, which I think is uh, uh, really, really fascinating. There's been um, some other samples uh, that have been dug up. Uh, a couple of years ago, people had dug up the DNA um, from some skeletons of people that had been buried during the Black Death. And so that was the 1300s. And there was always some questions about, you know, was the Black Death caused by this organism? Some people uh, have been doubters. And of course, they, uh, they looked for it and they found um, that organism's DNA. Now it's a little bit different uh, from modern versions of Yersinia pestis. Um, so about a dozen changes, and so the researchers right now are trying to, you know, look to see if those changes, uh, you know, maybe they, uh, you know, maybe those changes are significant enough to make, because, you know, uh, Black Death back then in the 1300s was a lot uh, more dangerous. People got much more ill back then, and could, could have been other environmental factors, right? Uh, here's another interesting story. This was, uh, again, not too many years ago. They found King Richard. Now, I don't really know a lot about King Richard. Um, he's featured in a Shakespeare play, and uh, he's very famously for known as the, uh, the last uh, King of England to die in battle. So they found, they found this skeleton, and they're like, we think this is King Richard. How can we prove this is King Richard? So they did some carbon dating. Uh, the skeleton had battle wounds, which is consistent with somebody dying in battle. Uh, he had some skeletal deformities in the Shakespeare play, he's a hunchback. So he was known to, uh, you know, maybe not have the proper posture or something like that. And then the last piece of evidence is they looked at the DNA and it turns out that he had a living relative who, believe it or not, was living in Canada and they were able to match the DNA and confirm that this indeed, um, you know, gives more evidence to suggest that it really was King Richard. So kind of an interesting uh, find here. And uh, these things are happening all the time. So one or two other things that are kind of interesting. Uh, we're looking at, uh, this pops up uh, um, at least every year or two. I see something about people talking about mammoths and mammoths are super cool. This is actually an older article. You can see 2008, but it has some cool uh, photos. And uh, it turns out with woolly mammoths, we have actual tissue specimens of them. And so we actually have the mammoth genome now. And uh, in 2000, this 2008 article, some scientists said he could do it for $10 million. I don't know if that's the case or not. But what would be the idea, right? You compare a mammoth uh, DNA to the uh, uh, African elephant, that's the closest uh, living relative. Uh, you know, it's not too hard to just go along and make, them, make those changes one at a time. We could do this by CRISPR very easily and maybe, uh, maybe make ourselves a mammoth. So that's an idea anyway. Uh, a little more recently, they found this guy. This is an article from 2017. This is basically a complete mammoth they found. I think the only thing missing is his tail. It's this cute little baby mammoth and uh, all sorts of soft tissues and DNA and all that. And uh, of course, people are saying we could even, you know, maybe not necessarily make a full mammoth, but maybe a mammoth elephant hybrid. So using some of these techniques, um, basically put the DNA in an embryo and put it into a, a mother, a surrogate mother. 
So I know I'm going a little fast. I just want to finish up on time here. Um, some other things are kind of scary, right? Um, look at this. Uh, you can go on the internet and you can get the sequence of poliovirus. And in theory, we could make it in a lab synthetically. Um, you know, so this is this is scary stuff, right? You know, we you know, like any technology, any technology can be used for good things and for harmful things. Um, so, you know, something to think about. So I'm just thinking here, I know we're running out of time. I'm probably not going to finish this. I'm talking too much. Um, I'll carry over some of these things next day, but I do want to talk. I'll, I'll just go until I'm out of time, basically. Um, so a big area that uh, I think I mentioned before with genetically modified organisms is, of course, um, food. Uh, this was the first genetically modified food back in 1994. So that's a long time ago. It's called the flavor saver. So uh, if you know about tomatoes, uh, usually, apparently, if you pick them when they're red, they're more flavorful. But if you want to pick them and then ship them, you're going to pick them when they're green. So what they did is they basically disabled the gene inside the tomato to make it uh, spoil at a slower rate. Um, unfortunately, this was a bit of a failure. People didn't want to pay more for tomatoes uh, back in the day, and this, this uh, project also failed. Um, so, you know, you can see, uh, like any new technology, sometimes it doesn't quite work the way you want it to work. Uh, another story that's been uh, making the headlines uh, here and there and, and sort of has been fizzling the last couple of years, but uh, is this project called Golden Rice. Uh, so Golden Rice, um, the idea was that, hey, uh, you know, a lot of people on this planet, they eat rice as a staple. Uh, so let's see if we can fortify it and add nutrients to it. So what they did is um, um, there's a, a chemical in there, uh, beta carotene, which is uh, converted by your body to vitamin A, and uh, it's made in other parts of the plant. So what they did is they changed the transcription factors in this uh, rice so that uh, the uh, uh, carotene would be produced in the grain. And so the rice ends up with sort of an orangey yellow color and it's called golden rice. So this one here has just been really slow to get started. And I think a lot of it has had to do with mistrust of genetically modified foods. And uh, so they've had a hard time getting this one going. I think there's some corporate interests as well. And, you know, it became a little bit more expensive, but uh, I think they're starting to actually use it in some countries now. Um, I haven't looked this one up in a couple of years, but uh, it's an interesting idea, right, of a project. So I'll show you some uh, couple uh, more successful uh, genetically modified projects and then we'll finish up today. So here's one uh, successful genetically modified uh, crop. Uh, it's called the Arctic apple. And uh, you probably know that apple's brown, right? So, uh, you know, what can we do to prevent this? Well, it turns out they can eliminate a gene and they can make these non-browning apples. I don't really know if this is much of a big deal. Uh, usually when I eat an apple, I just, I don't let it sit around cut for a while, um, but apparently you can buy these in the stores. I haven't seen them yet, but apparently they are selling and, and, and some people really like them. Maybe if you're cutting up your, uh, your apple for your, your child's uh, lunch or something like that, and, and um, you know, it's not browning, makes it a lot more desirable to eat. Uh, here's another um, genetically modified crop is um, these uh, virus resistant papayas. So it turns out a few years ago, papayas were almost entirely wiped out by some virus. I don't know much about this particular virus, uh, but papaya farmers were in deep trouble. And uh, this was a big deal. And so some scientists came along and they made it virus resistant. I don't know the mechanism behind that, um, but uh, I think something like 80% of the world's papaya today are now uh, genetically modified to be resistant to this because uh, all the other ones were basically entirely wiped out. So if you like papayas, there's a chance you might be eating genetically modified papayas. Um, you know, you can see this note here about being super important in Hawaii, right? It's the, uh, um, it's a, it's a very, very important crop. So one more example for you, and then I'll finish up for today. Uh, something that is found in Canada for sure, 100%, uh, are these genetically modified salmon. And so uh, it's called the aqua advantage. I don't know the full mechanism behind how they've made these salmon. Uh, it has something to do with the salmon uh, growth hormones. I think they made copies of the growth hormone gene. 
you can see there's uh, the big one is the modified salmon and the uh, little one is the, the natural salmon. And uh, so we're looking at a lot more meat and a lot less of time. And uh, these here are in fact found in the grocery stores. Now, I don't know um, where, I know they're in Canada. They're definitely in Quebec and Ontario. I don't know whether they're out here. So if you're interested in genetically modified food, uh, you know, something to look into and ask about. If you're not interested in, you don't want it on your plate, uh, you know, something to think about as well. So I'm gonna come back to these issues, kind of talk about some of the implications here next day, uh, give you that forensic example. I told you I had some CRISPR examples. Um, there's just too many interesting things. Uh, you know, I guess I just got a little long-winded today because there's some really fascinating projects that are being done out there. Uh, you know, with the mammoth research, I keep reading about it. There's so many cool things people are doing with mammoth DNA. Uh, somebody was making mammoth hemoglobin and trying to understand whether it had, um, you know, differences that made the mammoth more adapted to uh, cold climates and, and things like that. Um, so uh, I'll come back to this next day and we're going to uh, um, uh, start our uh, last unit on viruses. And uh, so that'll take about uh, Friday's lecture and. Um, uh, probably most of, of Monday's lecture and then uh, Wednesday's lecture will be review. Um, if people feel like they need more review, we can also use the time next, next Thursday. So just a quick reminder that we have our lab exam tomorrow. I will be sending out the exam and more uh, and, and basically a repeat of the instructions tomorrow. We get it at two o'clock. We have to return it to me by four o'clock. You're going to want to have um, some graph paper or a mechanism to graph and, uh, and uh, maybe a printer uh, and, uh, and some way to scan uh, some of your final answers. Some of it will be written directly into the document and some of it will be, uh, some will be written. Um, I have a graphing part and a couple other exercises that you are going to need to, uh, to do on paper. So if you have any questions about that, please get a hold of me. Uh, uh, and uh, before the lab exam, I will also tomorrow during the lab exam be available on Zoom for anybody who has any questions or clarifications. So sorry for going a couple of minutes over time. I'm going to finish up there and we will see you uh, uh, next time. Have a great evening.